Thanks for joining me today. We'll hear this time from The Black Mass, a series that aired primarily in the mid-1960s. Our story today is an adaptation of a story by M.R. James titled An Evening's Entertainment. This one first aired October 31st, 1964. Welcome to The Black Mass. Tonight, here is a tale about olden times, based, more or less, on the story by Montague Rhodes James, An Evening's Entertainment. Nothing is more common form in old-fashioned books than the description of the window fireside, where the aged grandam narrates to the circle of children that hangs on her lips story after story of ghosts and fairies, and inspires her audience with a pleasing terror. But we're never allowed to know what the stories were. Here, then, is a problem which has long obsessed me, but I see no way of solving it finally. The aged grandams are gone, and the collectors of folklore began their work too late to save most of the actual stories which the grandams told. Yet such things don't easily die quite out, and imagination working on scattered hints may be able to devise a picture of just such an evening's entertainment. Let's see now. There's the fire burning brightly in the large stone fireplace. On the one side sits the squire, exhausted by a long day after the partridges and replete with food and drink. On the other side, his old mother sits with her knitting and the children, Charles and Fanny, are gathered about her knee. Oh, I want to wind Granny's yarn. You did it last time. No, you did it twice before that. Well, that doesn't count because... Oh, now, now, my dears. You must be very good and quiet or you'll wake your father. And you know what'll happen then. Oh, yes, I know. And be won't he cross-tempered and send us off to bed. What's that? Fie on you, Charles. That's not a way to speak. Now, I was to have told you a story. 
But if you use such light words, I shan't. Oh, oh Granny, oh, please. Oh, oh, please. Oh, please, we'll be sure. Shh, 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 shh. Oh, now I do believe you have woken your father. Uh, hey, look there, Mother. You, you can keep them brats quiet. Yes, John, yes. Yes, it's too bad. I've been telling them if it happens again, off to bed they shall go. There now. You see, children, what did I tell you? You must be good and sit still. And I'll tell you what. Tomorrow you shall go a blackberry. <gasps> oh, God, <laughs> and, and if you bring home a nice basket full, I'll make you some jam. Oh, yes, Granny, do. And I know where the best blackberries are. I, I saw them today. Oh, and where's that, Charles, dear? Uh, I know, too, Granny. It, it's in the little lane. Well, it's the... in the little lane that goes up past Collins' cottage. Charles? Fanny? Whatever you do, don't you dare to pick one single blackberry in that lane. Don't you know? There, how should you? What was I thinking of? Well, anyway, you both mind what I say. Well, well, why, why, Granny? Why shouldn't we pick why them? Why shouldn't we pick them? Shh! Remember what I told your father. But, but well, Granny, why? why? Very well, then. I'll tell you about it. Only you mustn't interrupt. Here, Fanny, you can take the knots out of this skein for Granny. Uh, now, let me see. Oh, my, sounds like a storm blowing up outside, doesn't it, children? Well, no matter. We are safe and warm inside, aren't we? Well, now, that... Lane. All this, mind you, happened when I was quite a little girl. That lane was feared even then, and as far back as anyone can remember. And if something that happened to your granny on that lane is any indication, I've often wondered if there was any connection between what I saw and all that about Mr. Davis and his friend that I'm about to tell you. What did you see, Granny? Yes, what did you see, Granny? What did you see? Well, you know that lane passes near to the top of that hill uh, where you've seen that old figure cut out in the crag? Well, I was passing along there one evening. I was already late getting home for my supper. I remember seeing the currant and gooseberry bushes along the side leading to the top of the hill. The berries were ever so ripe and delicious. And before I realized, I had followed them, tasting one bush, then another, near to the top of the hill. Then I stopped for a moment. I was sure I heard something voices, I thought. But I, I couldn't make out plainly because of the wind. I couldn't make out whether they were coming from the top of the hill or from inside. Somewhere inside the hill itself, voices singing or calling or something. I wasn't frightened at all at first, and I remember walking farther up to see where the sounds were coming from, and the farther up I went, the more it seemed the voices were coming from all around me, from below as well as above. Then, suddenly, you know all those strange old rocks around the top of that hill? Beside one of those rocks. No one believed me when I told the story later, or made out they didn't believe me. Well, what I saw was a hand, a whole arm reaching up from out of the earth. Now, they, they say that the hill had once been a burial place in ancient times, and that a skeleton arm could very well be unearthed by the rains. <laughs> but that was no skeleton arm. There was flesh on it, dark and old, and long nails. 
or like claws. Now you can believe me or not, but I say I saw that arm reaching up out of the earth. And it wasn't a dead arm. When I came nearer, I saw its fingers moving like it was in pain, like it was beckoning me to help it. The rest of it, out of the earth. Now, I, I told you that I wasn't afraid, and that's true, until I got so close that it almost touched me. But then, then suddenly, a terrible fear overcame me, and I ran, ran all the way down the hill. And I have never once set foot on that place since. Well, now, it was only a short while after that that the events I was going to tell you about began. Uh, careful, Fanny, not too close to the fire with that yarn. That's better. Well, now, up at the far end of that lane, let, let me see, is it on... Is it on the right or on the left-hand side as you go up? Oh, yes, the left-hand side. You find a little patch of bushes and rough ground in the field and something like a broken old hedge round about and the kind of gooseberry and currant bushes I told you about growing among it. Well... That means there was a cottage stood there, of course. And in that cottage, there lived a man named Davis. This Mr. Davis lived very much to himself. He didn't work for any of the farmers, having, as it seemed, enough money of his own to get along. But he'd go to town on market days. And one day he came back from market and brought a young man with him. And this young man and he lived together for some long time and, and went about together. And whether he just did the work of the house for Mr. Davis or whether Mr. Davis was his teacher in some way, nobody seemed to know. He was a pale young man and hadn't much to say for himself. Well, now, what? did those two men do with themselves? <laughs> of course, I, I can't tell you half the foolish things that the people got into their heads. And we know, don't we, that you mustn't speak evil when you aren't sure it's true, even when people are dead and gone. But as I said, those two were always about together, late and early, and there's one walk that they take regularly to the place on the hill that I just told you about. And it was noticed that in the summertime they'd camp out there all night. I remember once my father, that's your great-grandfather, told me he had spoken to Mr. Davis and his young friend one evening when he met them on the road. He asked them why they were so fond of going up there. Why? Why, sir, it's a wonderful old place, and I've always been fond of the old-fashioned things. And when him, my boy here, and me are together there, it seems to bring back the old times of plain. Well, it may suit you, but I shouldn't like to be in a lonely place like that in the middle of the night. How, oh, sir, we don't want for company at such time. That is to say, Mr. Davies and me is company enough for each other. Ain't it so, master? Aye. Then there's a beautiful air there of a summer night, and you can see all the country round under the moon. Oh, it looks so different, seemingly, from what it do in the daytime. The bars there, the mounds, all over up there. Now, what would you think was the purpose of them, sir? Why, I've heard, Mr. Davis, that they're all graves. And I know when I've had occasion to plough up one, there's always been some old bones and pots turned up. But whose graves they are, I don't know. People say the ancient Romans were all about this country at one time. But whether they buried the people like that, I can't tell. Ah, oh, to be sure. Well, they look to me to be older like than the ancient Romans. And dress different. Uh, that's to say, according to the pictures the Romans was in armor. 
And you didn't never find no armor, did you, sir? Eh, not by what you said. Well, I don't know that I mentioned anything about armor. But it's true, I don't remember to have found any. But you'll talk as if you'd seen them, Mr. Davis. Seen them, sir? That would be a difficult matter after all these years. Not but what I should like well enough to know more about them old times and people, and what they worshipped and all. Worshipped? Well, I dare say I've heard and read about them heathens and their worship. Torture and dances, behavior lewd and ungodly, sacrifices. Oh, torture and dances, you say? Sacrifices, you say. Oh. Lewd and ungodly behavior. What manner do you suppose? Read about them, you say. Heathen, you say. That was the only time my father had much talk with Mr. Davis. It was around that time that people believed some sort of meetings went on at night time on that hill, and that those who went there were up to no good. And there was known to be others besides Mr. Davis and his young man, I mean. And it was only guessed what really went on. and torches, <laughs> Master, <laughs> Not so close to the fire with the yarn, Fanny dear. Now mind what I say, else you find yourself going up in flames. Don't stretch that skein so, Charles. Hold it loosely. That's it. Well, now. Well, I suppose it was a matter of three years that Mr. Davis and this young man went on living together. And then, all of a sudden, a dreadful thing happened. I don't know if I ought to tell you what it was. Oh, yes, yes so Granny, please, Granny, 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 please. Well, then, you must promise not to get frightened and go screaming out into the middle of the night. Oh, no, we no, won't. we won't. Oh, of course we won't. Well, one morning, very early, towards the turn of the year, I think it was in September, one of the woodmen had gone up to his work near the hillside just as it was getting light. What he saw nearly drove the poor man out of his wits. He dropped everything he was carrying and, and ran as hard as ever he could straight down to the parsonage and woke up old Mr. White. Uh, parson, uh, Parson White, uh, Parson White. What is it, man? Hope. Oh. Quiet, glory be. What's the matter with you? Oh, Parson, sir, come with me quickly. It's oh, horrible, it's horrible. Man. Oh, but what? you must come with me to see what it's been done. What's been done? Calm, will you kind down and tell me what it is, man? What have you oh, seen? Oh, oh, in the little woods near the hill. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, so I was going up to my work and, and I saw it in a clearing. A, a white thing, what, what oh. looked like uh, through the mist. A white Like a man. Uh, like a man, sir. And when I came near, I saw it was a man. Mr. Davies, young man, sir. What? Oh, he, he, he was dressed in a sort of white gown, sir. He, oh, uh, foolish. Yes, he was. Sir. And he was hanging by his neck to the limb of the biggest oak. Quite, quite dead, sir. Glory be. But, but, but the real horrible thing, sir, was his hands. His hands. Oh, oh, I don't think there were any hands. What? No, I, I couldn't rightly see for, for the blood, sir. Oh, the blood. May the Lord bless us and save us. What a sight to behold! A demon's work, if ever I saw on himself before us! His left hand chopped clean off. Oh, if clean we can call it. Maybe cleansed would be the word for it. Cleansed, but for the right. Blood! Blood! Uh, oh, there, oh. Parson, there, just below. I hadn't seen before. Look, sir. What? Oh! The hatchet! Oh, the hatchet on the ground the here! Stuck with blood and bits of flesh. Horrible. Huh? Some flies on it already. Oh, don't touch it. Don't, don't touch it. Do you think, sir, that this is a murder? It's an abomination. Oh. An abomination, but I think it's his own act. I think so. You see here the rock over here? Uh -huh. he, he could have jumped from it and... 
Oh. Yes, it must have been. You can see the saints, the blood, the hand. I saw tis the hand where he chopped it off. And there it lies. Oh, a sight, sir. Such a thing. Oh, and do you see, sir? Do you see it is grasping something? So it is. What with all so. the blood can you make it out? Oh. It seems, it seems flesh. It seems part of a living body. Oh, sir, what do you think? God's mercy. Oh. I think it's no living body whose part this be. This is Mr. Davis's man, you say, on the tree. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, I think we'd best, best find uh, what we can of of Mr. Davis himself. Oh, yes, sir. We'd better hurry, Come I think. Now. Come on, Come. sir. The cottage is down there. Oh, uh, on the hill, you see, in the, in the field. Over there. Well, now, the door of the cottage stood wide open, and the two men rushed in, not knowing what horrors to expect. Uh, Mr. Davis! Uh, Mr. Davis! But Mr. Davis! When they came to the little room which served as a parlour... Oh! oh. oh. Bless us and save us. What oh, they look, saw. Oh, oh, they would oh, not forget oh, the sight for the rest oh, of their many, lives. Many, 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 what did they see? Well, there oh, in the centre of the room... The work of the devil's own devil. ...was a table that had been set up as a kind of altar or place of torture and stretched across his feet in clamps attached to the foot and his wrists held at the corners above his head spread out naked facing upwards lay Mr. Davis his body almost in shreds from a whip which lay beside him a tangle of blood and flesh but the worst of it oh the worst of it the work of the axe. Just below the breastbone, the body had been sliced as far down and torn open, and inside the axe had hacked and slashed away. A part of the spine stuck up, but nothing else was recognizable except the blood. Oh, the blood everywhere. And the strangest thing of all... Do you see the, uh, the face, Woodman? I, sir, the most what? horrible part. What a mark on it. The eyes staring up. Oh. With the mouth open into a terrible grin. Oh. oh! Did you see that twitch? Yes. The man... Man can't still be alive and, oh, no, and breathing. And, and, and trying to speak, it seemed. Oh. Both men leaned close to hear... And swore later what they heard, though no one could make sense of it. But they swore they saw the mouth move and the words barely audible come forth. Ah, again, again, more, more, more. Well, now, Fanny, you're shivering, dear, and so close to the fire. Uh, you should fetch a woolly from upstairs, dear. N no, Granny. I'm not cold. Well, here, you put Granny's shawl round you anyway. <sighs> That's it, now. Uh, well, did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Did, did they bury Mr. Davis? Oh, that they did, and his young man together. That very night, but not in hallowed ground, as Parson White would have none of that, but up on the hill. And it was no proper burial either. Some of the men just dug a hole large enough and gathered rock. Only those few men needed for the task were there. They heard the bell. It's not coming from the church, Parson. No, we can all hear. It's coming from inside the hill. For the coming of them of their own. Aye, Parson. 
And when we dug the grave, we could swear, but for the darkness and only the candles lighting, we struck things that screamed and pulled oh, themselves deeper into the earth. Oh, we, we've no place here. This isn't the Lord's ground. Quickly now, throw the bodies in. Cover them with rocks and some earth. And be away now, come on. And they did. But it wasn't exactly the end of the story. What what happened then, Granny? What's that sound, Granny? Do you hear it? Ah, the sound. I'm coming to that. Well, next morning, some of the town folks passing by saw those strange black patches on the road leading up the hill like a trail. They, they look to be alive like. Oh, how could they be? But they shimmer so. And when they went closer... Oh, God preserve us. Flies. Thousands of huge flies. And look what they've been feeding on. Patches of blood from those bodies that were rolled up last oh, night. Where did they come from? Well, there's never been so many flies about. Oh, oh look! Lifting up all along! Oh, the sky is black with that! Oh, 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 oh. They found the women, swollen beyond recognition, almost changed in shape, you might say looking more like them horrible half-animal monsters you see pictures of in ancient books. But almost as fast as they came, they were gone, the blood cleaned from the road, and as some folks swore, taken back by the flies into the hill. Now, Charles. Yes, Granny. And Fanny. Yes, Granny. Now, I want you to pay special attention to what I'm going to tell you. You remember my saying about them blackberry bushes, not to pick a single blackberry? Yes, yes, mm. Granny. Well, from what I'm going to tell you now, you can judge for yourselves. Now, I said those flies went back into the hill, or wherever they came from, but that wasn't the end of it. Some of them is always seen about up there. And it was one day, while I was courting your grandfather, we were walking up there among those very bushes, and one of them berries, at least I thought it was, seemed to come alive in my hand. I felt the sting that couldn't open my hand. Now I can only say what I know. A numbness went over me. I heard sounds. Then something like a terrible whip. I can't remember all that happened. But your grandfather says he had to hold me from doing things. And it was his own words that the very devil had gotten into me. Later, when I opened my hand and wiped the awful insect away, I couldn't tell. From me or the demon itself. So you both mind what I say and find your blackberries down in the hollow near the creek. Oh, but but look at the time. Off with you, off with you to bed. Oh, oh granny. granny. Off with you now. Granny. Can, can we have a candle tonight? A candle? Certainly not. Now, off with you and, and Granny will come and tuck you in later. Go on. Oh, oh Granny. And, and Granny. Charles? Really early, Charles, please. don't you frighten your sister up oh. there in the dark or there'll be no more stories for you. Uh, 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 Mother, what's that? Oh, I've just sent them off to bed. Oh, you've been telling them those stories again. You, you know, Mother, that none of them is true. Where do you get them from? Well, some of it's true, and the rest... Well, it's 
like I take hold of something and pull gently, and the rest comes up all of its own. Mm. Well, well, I couldn't tell you where it comes from. Uh, I'm going to my bed, too. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see to locking up, Mother. Uh, well, good night. Oh, I'll see to it. Good night, Sonny. Ah, yes. I'll just sit a little while longer. Where? Ah, where do they come from? Where? That was, we hope, an evening's entertainment by Montague Rhodes, James. Pat Franklin played Granny. Her children were played by Marion Winch and Arlene Sagan. The narrator and Parson White were played by Bernard Mays. Don LePage was Mr. Davis. And Frank Laverdi played Granny's father. Mr. Davis's young man and the woodman and the snoring father were played by Eric Bowersfeld, and the two ladies who were eaten by the flies were Arlene Sagan and Pat Franklin. The technical production for the story was by John Whiting, and the adaptation was by Eric Bowersfeld. And now, good night. That's the horror for today. If you want to hear more from the Black Mass, find past episodes of the horror, find all the other podcasts, our shoutcast stream, and everything else Relic Radio, just visit relicradio.com. And if you enjoy this show and all the other podcasts and would like to help support it, you can click on our donate button as well. Your donations make all of this possible. Thank you, as always, for donating. Thanks for joining me today. Talk to you again next week with another episode of the horror. The Horror is produced by and for RelicRadio.com. Rebroadcast of this show without permission is strictly prohibited.